Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Brittany Branion, and I serve as director of Curie Center Collegiate and Community Programs to include the nonprofit affiliate program, currently serving over 120 nonprofits in East Alabama and beyond. Welcome to the Curie Center Summer Fundraising Series program titled Securing Major Gifts. Before we begin, I would like to share a little more about the Nonprofit Affiliate Program for those of you who are unfamiliar. The Curie Center Nonprofit Affiliate Program fosters a community of educators, professionals, organizations, and students who have a desire to embody philanthropy, nonprofit studies, and leadership in their professional and personal lives. We provide professional development and networking opportunities to members to include mix and mingles, the Curie Center Volunteer Internship and Career Fair, Meet Me at the Vic, and the Curie Center Nonprofit Summit. In addition to these events, now more than ever, we are focusing on professional development and learning opportunities to include our summer fundraising series and the Nonprofit Affiliate Book Club. Curie Center Nonprofit Affiliates are the first to learn of upcoming programming and membership is free. I will include information on how to join the Nonprofit Affiliate Program and would be delighted to have the pleasure of working with you, especially as we all navigate this challenging time. We are also winding down our survey titled The COVID-19 Effect on Alabama and Georgia Nonprofits, and I will be sure to include that information in the email to follow today's program. Now, let's get to the reason you are all here. Please join me in welcoming today's speaker. Margaret Schlereth Arnold graduated from Michigan State University in 2004, where she began her career in development. Advancing quickly in her career, Margaret transitioned into a role at Austin P. State University in Clarksville, Tennessee, where she served as a special fund coordinator and later became a major gift fundraiser and director of annual giving. Margaret then moved to Nashville, working at Belmont University as the Director of Advancement Services and Special Gifts. She was then promoted to the Director of Parent Giving and Major Gifts. Bringing her wealth of experience to Auburn University, Margaret joined the Samuel Ginn College of Engineering Office of Development in 2012. Starting as a Development Officer, Margaret oversaw the establishment and growth of 100 plus Women Strong, an alumni group dedicated to recruiting, retaining, and rewarding Auburn women in engineering. She ascended in the ranks and was promoted to the Assistant Director of Development in 2018, and then Director of Development in 2019. In April 2020, Margaret was appointed the Senior Director of Development for the Samuel Ging College of Engineering where she oversees a large team of fundraisers, coordinators, and stewardship and engagement liaisons. Under her leadership, the Engineering Development Office is responsible for $30 million annually in support of the college. In addition to her leadership role, Margaret continues to serve as a major gift fundraiser. Margaret is a member of Leadership Lee County, where she currently serves as the board of director, on the board of directors. She has also served as a member of the Leadership Clarksville Class of 2011, the U.S. Army Family Readiness Group Key Caller for 161 CAV, the Clarksville Young Professional and the Na Professionals and the Nashville Cable. Since 2016, Margaret has served as a Church of the Highlands small group leader. We are thankful she took the time to join us today and share her knowledge and passion for securing major gifts. Without any further delay, please welcome Margaret Schlereth Arnold. Thank you, Brittany. Um, I have to tell you that I look at the I looked at the list of who all was attending this yesterday, and I thought there are plenty of you on here who could teach this. So, who could do any anything I say in here is going to be common knowledge to a lot of you. So, if you have any um, questions or if you have any input, I'm happy to hear that because I know there are a lot of really strong fundraisers in this community who are on this call. Um, so I, um, Brittany started out talking about my experience, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I've done, because I think sometimes when we're talking to nonprofits in particular, especially folks from the university, we know that we're part of a big machine at, at Auburn and we're one little lane in it, and that um, sometimes when you're at a smaller nonprofit, you're all of the lanes and you're wearing all of the hats. 
And so I wanted you to know I have the experience of having been in those scenarios. So at Michigan State, I was in a small lane, just like I am here. But I started on the phone as a telemarketer, as a student caller. So I was probably um, 19 when I, just, I went on a visit. They do a great job there of taking their student callers on visits with, um, on, if a student caller thinks that they might be interested in fundraising, they'll take them on a visit with an alum. So I decided when I was 19, this was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, which is not how most of us get into fundraising. But um, so I started out making phone calls to alumni. So I've done it from the ground up. Um, and then at Austin P, it's a small, small university, and they had me raising money for football, math, science, the library, and then I did their phonathon, and I did a car raffle. It was like just whatever you can do. And I was young, and um, my husband was deployed all the time, so I just worked all the time and did everything they wanted. But that was the type of program where if you brought back a thousand dollars on a trip, you were well celebrated. So. Um, while Brittany mentioned that we raise $30 million a year, I have been in offices where it's a big deal to bring back a $100 check or a $1,000 check. Um, at Belmont, they had me in charge of parent fundraising um, and then a women's auxiliary, which is a like a little women's philanthropy board sort of thing. And then um, I've been at Auburn now for eight years and started as a, as a development officer, as she said, and have all of those things I felt like permit, prepared me to do the frontline fundraising, 100% travel, you know, it's 40% of our time, but my, my main job has been frontline fundraising. Um, and each of us in our office are responsible to raise probably two to four, two to four, two to five million dollars a year. And then as Brittany mentioned, I just um, took the senior director role. So I actually will be doing less travel, but um, we have, I have the whole $30 million goal now which keeps me up at night. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, so I just put this on here because not everybody has their resume by mascot and I'm lucky to have this, so I feel like it's fun to show. Um, those are the four places I've worked. I can't get another job ever because then I won't be able to use this photo anymore, but um, my husband worked on a Brad Paisley video um, that had, he had them all stand together. He purposefully invited these four mascots so he could get this picture for me, so that's fun. Um, thank you for indulging me. Okay, so I'm going to go through um, what I feel like are best practices for major gifts only. There's, I know that there's direct mailing and there's annual giving and social media and peer-to-peer -peer and crowdfunding and all the things that are really important about fundraising, but my expertise is really frontline major gift fundraising. Um, I feel like major gift is different for everyone. So major gift for some of you might be a $5,000 gift. It might be a $10,000 gift. It might be a million dollar gift. And I understand that. So I'm giving it, I'm gonna to try to do this from that perspective that your major gift is whatever your major gift is. Um, to me, if you're talking about fundraising, I understand that in a lot of nonprofits, you have to do the events. I mean, we do too, but you have to, we are lucky at a university that you have this group of people who are affiliated because they went to Auburn and we have their graduate, you know, their information and things like that. But if you're working from a nonprofit, you have to do events just to get, just to even find prospects. But to me, if you, a lot of times we spend six months planning an event that generates $30,000, which is wonderful, but, and you need the events. But if you can also at the same time have a couple of face-to-face -face visits that generate large gifts, that's worth your time too. So if you can do them in tandem, I think that's the best. But um, so I'm gonna go through a couple of these. Uh, uh, my slides will be about a case statement, having champions, finding prospects, making personal visits, making direct asks, and then stewardship of those. And if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I'm totally fine with interrupting. Um, and I can't see everybody. I, I have given this presentation, I think two or three times, and I love it face to face because I can see people. So um, I'm happy to have any feedback as we go. It's much harder this way. Um, okay, so for your case statement, I feel like you have to have an enthusiastic, intentional leader. And um, if you don't have one, then I think that has to be you. And so sometimes programs have that person that just has all that passion. And our, we're lucky in the College of Engineering that we have a dean that, that is that way. But at Belmont, uh, they didn't. They just didn't have somebody who got in front of alumni in that way. They had great leaders, but not people who were had that goal and had that enthusiasm. And so I had to go out and do a lot of the legwork myself and figure out the case statement and then be that enthusiastic person. But if you have an enthusiastic, intentional leader, it's really lovely to get them in front of people. Um, I think that you have to have a written and concrete and attainable vision. I feel like the best thing um, 
for Hunter Women Strong, for instance, we have, it's the course to recruit, retain, and reward women in engineering. That's very clear. And it's easy to say, and now our alumni say it back to us. And then our dean, his, is, his vision is to be the best student-centered experience in the country. So that can mean all sorts of things. But our alumni repeat that back to us all the time now. So if you have a really clear, attainable, big vision, your, your best supporters will start to sell it for you. Um, and you have to have a compelling story to tell and then have the huge dream prepared. So um, I think all you have to kind of be prepared at all levels, right? If someone can give a small, small annual gift, you have to know what you're going to use that for. But our dean had, he's the best example of had, um, he called it BHAGs, like big, hairy, audacious goals when he started. And he had a five year, um, five years to do that. And he came up with five things that seemed absurd, like things he absolutely couldn't do. But that means when somebody does really connect with your organization and they have that, hey, I'm going to give you guys $10,000. You don't go, uh, I don't know what to do with that. You have to have a little bit of planning in place to know, great, if we got that, this is exactly where we would plug that in. And I'm sure most of you do know exactly how you would spend money, but you just need to make sure that it's a really clear plan in case those, those dollars do walk in the door. Um, Hunter Women Strong is that way because of the vision, like I said, but I also was liaison for civil engineering, and I would ask them all the time. I'm like sitting here thinking I have no civil, civil people connected on here, but um, I would ask them all the time what they were interested in raising, you know, what their goals were, and they literally could not get it on a piece of paper, and I couldn't dig it out of anybody. I mean, I think I went through the department chair and an assistant department chair and two faculty members before I pieced together enough of what I could sell for them. But that versus Hunter Women Strong, it's easier, it's more fun to fundraise for somebody that really has a vision. Um, so sometimes it takes us having to go, and that's not always fun to do the legwork to go find your own vision. But if you don't have somebody really producing that for you, I think you have to find it. Um, my next slide says Martin Luther King didn't get up 50 years ago and say, I have a budget and a plan. And that, so to me, it's like a lot of times people, especially I work in engineering. And so engineers will say, I have the, and they'll, they'll get up with a budget and a plan, a really detailed plan. And we're like, no, 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 we need a vision, which is different, right? So um, I think it's important to know the details because donors who are really, um, some donors are going to want to know your details, but I think the vision is what you go out and sell. The details are what you follow up with it to steward people with. Um, some of the questions I feel like it's worth asking are um, these sorts of things. So um, what are your organization's top funding initiatives? How much money is needed for those? Uh, why are those initiatives important? When will the funding be needed? Are there additional initiatives after this that will come down the road? And then how do these initi initiatives help your organization fulfill its mission? Why is this compelling and unique? And then is your organizational house in, the, in order? So what I mean is if you start to get money, are you ready to be able to give receipts? Are you ready to be able to send thank you notes? Are you ready to be able to, you just have to have all that in order before you start actually taking money and you have to be able to steward the money. Um, is it really, is there a fund set up for it to get to that thing? All those organizational processes have to be in place. Um, and if you can't answer any of those questions, I feel like you have a little bit of homework to do before you can do major gift fundraising. Um, and then once you start to raise money, I feel like the, um, for these things, your stories are going to start to grow. So um, with Hunter Women Strong, at first, all we had was a vision. I didn't have any great stories about it, right? But once we started raising money, my best example I use on the, on the road to tell people we had an event in the fall with freshmen students and their parents and they um we have a keynote speaker and then they break out into um groups like a reception and the chemical engineers will meet with chemical engineering alumni but then they also get to meet all the, all the other chemicals and civil and we do it for every discipline so they get to meet people who are going to be in their classes other women and there are very few women right per discipline it's getting better um but uh we also have them meet with those alumni. So there might be 10 alumni who are also chemical engineers that they get to meet that day. And we had a mom walk up to us and she said, I have to tell you all something. She said, I live in Colorado. My flight is tonight at 5 p.m. We were meeting at like 11 in the morning or something or nine in the morning. And she said, I was going to call and cancel my flight because we've been here three days 
and my daughter has cried all three days and she said she hasn't met anybody in her dorm. She is miserable here. And she said, I just walked past her. It's like, makes me cry telling the story still. It's like my story. So she said, look at her over there. She said, I just walked past my daughter and my daughter said, look, was laughing with these girls. And she looked at my, looked at me and said, mom, these are my people. And I'm like, that's why we raise money, right? That's why we do it so that those moments happen. And I'm like, now I tell every single person who I ask to join, which is a thousand dollars a year, when I ask them to join Hunter Women Strong, I tell them that story. Cause I'm like, that's why we're doing the work we're doing. So once you start, it's hard because some of the stories that are the inspiration that allow you to raise money have to happen once you're really raising the money. So um, one of the things I feel like you really need is a couple of champions. And I'm sure you all have this with boards and things like that. And just, you can probably think right away, who are my two people that give the most to this program and they love it as much as I do. Um, if you have at least two people to start as your lead donors, and they're your people who um, they provide influence and leads. So with Hunter Women Strong, for example, we picked two women who loved, who really believed in recruiting women into engineering. They were really strong in their own environment, their own communities. They also had influence at their companies. So their, um, their two companies became our first corporate sponsors. So they got all their friends to join and then they start getting people to join. They get people excited. It just helps to have a couple of people who, um, it becomes a peer to peer thing more than it is us telling people why they should join. They also are people who kind of know your inside baseball. So sometimes they know your icky stuff, but that's okay because, I, and I think there's this fine line about donors, right? That we always want to provide our best face forward to them so that they want to give to the program. But the people who are this engaged that you're asking to really help you to fundraise, to me, sometimes know the hard part, the political parts, and the things that they just have to know to be really useful to us. Um, those people to me have to be the people who can make your transformational gift and a transformational gift could be $10,000 or it could be 10 million. Um, and they say now, you know, the 80, 20 rule, they're saying now it's a 90, 10, that really most of your gifts are going to come from this core group of people. Um, and a lot of that has to do with putting the right people to the right project. So our, for Hunter Women Strong, for example, we started with two women who were our co-chairs and then it led to a group of about 15 to 20 who became our executive committee. And, when you look back now on that first executive committee, I think that 15 of those women of the 20, or maybe it's like 10 of 15, the majority of them have made major gifts since then. But it was just that kind of involvement. And most of them did um, scholarships for females, or they named a room in a new building, or, um, and they're also supporting Hunter Room Strong $1,000 a year. But that kind of inside baseball was, one, helpful to us to find new prospects, but it also helped us to grow them I mean, that cultivated them to be ready for a major gift. Um, and we called those women all the time. Like, I feel like they felt like they were on staff for us for a while while we were growing the program. Um, one thing to, sometimes we would plant them, like the people that we really knew, if you knew you needed to get a certain message across, we would, they'd be the people we'd use. The dean would say, can you have this person and this person start this conversation? Because it was easier to come from them than from the dean, those sorts of things. So we really use them really strategically. So I feel like every program needs a couple of people that just are willing to, at least for the first two years of your major gifts, really help you in dig in deep, almost like a, like a staff member. Um, any questions yet? Sorry. It's hard to do this on a thing because I just want to talk to people. Um, I want, I want to hear from you all. Uh, okay. So finding prospects, um, your closest volunteers and your champions may not have capacity. And then your people with the most wealth may not be your people who have the most inclination to give. Right. So I, I say you have to have inclination and capacity to be a major gift, to be somebody you're really considering for major gifts. And retention is more successful than, than, than actually going out to find a new donor. So I feel like sometimes we're always looking for new people, but a lot of times your people are the people who are already giving or who've already made a major gift. So if you steward those well, you're more likely to get a second gift. That's an easier gift than going out to find somebody brand new and starting a whole new relationship. Um, for in inclination, I feel like you can look at past giving event participation, if they give to similar similar giving to other char charities, if they serve on philanthropic boards, and then um, if they have a motivation for giving, if there's something that you know about them that means they're really gonna connect with your nonprofit. And then capacity is about wealth indicators. I feel like sometimes 
um, people feel like it's built by building a personal relationship. Like you're not going to find out. Um, we can do a lot of research online, but when you really sit down with somebody, that's when they say things like, well, we're going to our second home or, or, you know, we're going on this vacation or I'm paying, even I'm paying for a kid's wedding this, this year, you know, I feel like sometimes people think this part of our job is icky, you know, that we're really, um, but if you're building real relationships with somebody, you do have to look for wealth indicators so that you're making the right asks. And to me, I'm, I'm almost, I feel like I'm doing a disservice if I don't pay attention to those things because I shouldn't ask somebody for a major gift when I know they're, they're, they've got two kids in college and they're paying for two weddings or something like that would be, they would go, did you not hear anything I said about who I am right now in this? So I feel like sometimes people go, oh, you really look for those things? I'm like, yeah, to make the right, to make the right timing of an ask and the right amount. So I'm a little bit unapologetic about the wealth indicator thing because I feel like that's the part of this career that I think sometimes people get embarrassed about, but I think it's important. Um, so if somebody isn't both, if they don't have inclination or they don't have capacity, we have a lot of people who have inclination, but maybe they don't have capacity. I feel like they can have a place in our organization, but you have to be okay with mentally moving on from them from a major gift. And that's okay to do that too and go, I, they're categorized. I know exactly. It allows me to say that this person's not it and it, because we only have a finite amount of time we can spend on major gifts. So you don't want to spend it on the people who, even though they love your organization a ton, they're probably not going to give a major gift. Um, let's see. Okay, so for personal visits, I'm a huge, 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 huge believer in goals. So I've worked at places that didn't give me goals and then I've worked at places that have and I am 400 times more successful with goals. And I've hired people who have really clear goals and it just, it's very clear right away whether you can do major gifts once you have real goals. So I encourage people to either give themselves goals or even be courageous enough to ask whoever you report to, to give you real goals about, and they don't have to be about money because the money, we can't make the money fall, but you can get in front of a certain number of people and make a certain number of asks. So if those, if you have those two goals, I feel like you can be a fundraiser because it's like you're going to get out and get in front of people if you have a goal you have to make and it it has to be reasonable I understand that with nonprofits a lot of times you're doing all the you're doing everything you're doing the newsletter you're doing event you're doing everything and so you may only have 10% of your time to handle with major gifts so make it reasonable but make sure you know that every month you have to get out and make a face-to-face -face look at somebody kind of visit um so I have goals and metrics on here and making calls um so cold calling is, it's funny, maybe because I did the telemarketing thing, but I love calling people. And it's like, everyone else hates it. I love getting on the phone because, um, and some folks, our teams all do it differently. Some people have their coordinator make all their calls or they just do emails to get appointments. I love picking up the phone and calling and it takes so much more time than sending an email, uh, especially a huge email, uh, you know, mass email, but I love to sit on the phone because a lot of times I can convince somebody to meet with me who wouldn't have met with me, I think, if they hadn't gotten on the phone with me. And so um, I feel the same way about, I mean, I've actually had somebody after a call go, oh, I wasn't going to meet with you. You're good at your job. I'm like, sorry. <laughs> so, and they started a scholarship. I mean, the first time I met with them, but I knew it was somebody I'd been wanting to meet with. And I thought if I can just get them on the phone. So the other thing about making calls is you have to make, and this is with Auburn where we're talking engineering alumni, I have to make 10 calls, 10 to 12 to get one visit. So if you're talking about people that are even a little bit further removed from your organization, that's even harder. So you also have to be really driven. I almost set up, this is so silly, but I'll set up like a, I usually do it with food or candy, but I'm like, if I get through 15 calls, I can eat this piece of candy. I don't know. <laughs> Like I have to come up with some sort of motivating, you know, motivating thing to get me through calling. And I have to be in the right mood because another thing, um, this is so silly, but in telemarketing, they used to always say smile while you dial, but people can hear your enthusiasm. And so if I'm in a bad mood or not a bad mood, but just not a great mood and I make calls, I'm like, I'm not getting any visits. And I'm like, people can hear your enthusiasm. And so make sure you're calling on days where you feel it. Um, so face-to-face -face visits, I feel like nothing can replace this. So phone calls and even Zoom calls. I miss face-to-face -face visits so much right now. But um, sitting down with somebody and building a relationship and having a face-to-face -face meeting over coffee or whatever is is hugely, huge, huge, huge a piece of major gift fundraising. Um, so when you do sit down with somebody, it offers up an organizational update. It gives them info 
you can talk about the successes and challenges and priorities. It informs the donor of any gift they've made previously. So when you go into that meeting, make sure you're ready to tell them how we've used your money previously. Um, it informs donors of recent successes of the organization. Um, and then it also, I said description of new products, but it's really like if you have a new, um, you're starting to raise money for a scholarship or you're, for us, it's like a new room naming opportunity, a new building is coming online or, um, we have new professors that need professorships or whatever that is. It, the face-to-face -face visits give us an opportunity to introduce some of those things. Um, okay, so the passion question, I feel like you have to build report. Say you're in a meeting. So now we're at, like we're in a meeting with somebody. After you've made 120 phone calls or whatever you're making to get 10 visits, you know, and you're sitting down with somebody, I think building rapport means just building a friendship and building a relationship. And I think that, the most the people who are most successful at major gift fundraising are people who really build friendships well with people and so i've gotten to the point i feel like in my career where i have alumni who say i love you to me at the end of calls and i say i love you too and i mean it you know we're friends and i and we're lucky we're so lucky in this career field that we're invited to some of their their anniversary parties and their birthday things and some of their most special moments they think to include us because we're their friends and truth be told when people are making philanthropic decisions it's a big deal. And so you get to be a piece of a real, and sometimes they're creating real legacy. And so you're a piece of a really important part of their lives. And a lot of times their children's lives too. So when you start out meeting with somebody, building rapport can take up to 30 minutes. You know, it can be half of, it can be a whole hour where you're just talking to somebody. Um, I feel like you have to find your story about your program. So when I came to Auburn, people, it was really hard because I had never really been to the state of Alabama. I didn't even understand the War Eagle thing. <laughs> like people would say War Eagle, I'm like, good morning? I don't, I don't know. And it just was, I mean, I was just like a fish out of water. And, um, but I, the culture was so unique to me. You know, Auburn's a really special place. And so I could tell that right away, but I was almost like an outsider for a really long time or felt like it. And so I would meet with alumni and they'd tell me their stories and I kept going, wow, this is so wonderful. And I felt like my story had to happen to me. So I had only been here 11 months and I was um, married to someone who was in the military. And we moved here because he got moved to Fort Benning, Georgia. And we had been in Clarksville, Tennessee prior to that. And so um, we'd only been here 11 months and he actually passed away and it was unexpected. And they called it, it wasn't a heart attack. It was a cardiac event. And I was 29, was I 30, 29 or 30? I don't even know now. And um, he, um, I had a two and a half year old. And so I thought, well, will I move back? I didn't want to move back to Michigan. I knew that he died in November. And even in the cold, I was like, or even in my middle of my grief, I was like, no, don't want to move to where it's snowing. But I thought maybe I would move back to Tennessee where we had had our home. And then the Auburn family thing happened, which anybody who's connected to this university knows all about that. And, um, and so our dean of the College of Engineering actually came in and said, um, he said, I'm going to take, and I, I travel for a living. So I'm like, well, what am I going to do now? Because I'm a single mom and I travel 40% of the time. And so he came in and said, um, I'm going to take you off the road for a year. I want you to sit in that chair right there and I want you to park in that parking lot. That's all I want you to do. And he said, I just want you to heal. And I'm like, you know, I need to fundraise for you. And he said, no, I just, I need you to grieve and I need you to heal. And all of my coworkers, which this is hard because we're relationship builders, traded their territory for me and gave me their local territory and took my faraway travel. And so no one has to do that for you, right? Um, and so the, that Auburn family thing is real, but that became my Auburn story. So now when I'm meeting with alumni, it makes me have to be really vulnerable because I have to tell my most vulnerable story I have to tell them like, this is why Auburn's important to me. This is why I believe in this Dean. This is why I believe in my coworkers. This is why I believe in the Auburn story. This is, this is my Auburn story, but it makes it, but that's the truth. I mean, that is my story and it's why I care so much. It's why I want to fundraise. It's why I believe in our Dean's vision because he cares about people and he cares about students in the same exact way that he cared about me. And so I feel like you have to find that thing and it doesn't have, I mean, that's as vulnerable and as, as you know, it doesn't have to be that raw, but to me, for me to make sense to somebody and for my work to make sense and my connection to Auburn. Now, a lot of people are in their are, are, like if you're raising money for something, a lot of times it's something you're really passionate about innately for some really great reason. And a lot of alumni, a lot of fundraisers for Auburn, for instance, are alumni. And so they have their own really great reason they loved Auburn. I had to find mine because I wasn't an Auburn alum. So I think that takes a little bit of vulnerability to be really real about who you are and why you care about the program. Because if you care about the program, that makes them that much more 
it, you know, if you're that enthusiastic, it makes that them that much more likely to trust you and to believe in your vision that you're sharing. Um, the passion question, the what would you like to accomplish with your money that would be meaningful to you? There are all sorts of ways to say that, but that really is the core question of, I feel like every fundraiser uses that of some way. How do people want to use their money that's meaningful to them? It's really easy sometimes to um, say, here's the Dean's bit for us, here's the Dean's vision, and kind of shove those things down people's throats and say, these are the three things we really need. But a huge part of our job is just listening because sometimes those three things may not be what that donor wants to give to. Um, the follow up questions, I think it's good to identify passion in the first meeting and then explain opportunities that match. And it's really good to encourage a donor to name a dollar amount. I felt like for the longest time I would basically make an ask and then I couldn't handle the silence and I would talk into it and I wouldn't let them really give me a real answer because that's the most nerve wracking thing about major gifts is making an ask and then sitting there quietly. And so I almost have to, for a long time, I physically sat on my hands as a reminder to just be quiet because I talk with my hands, because um, that's the hard part. And, and I think you really have to identify what level of gift are you talking about? You know, if somebody starts talking about wanting to make a gift, you have to say the words, what level of gift are you thinking about? Uh, and even if it's, I think even as you ease yourself into learning to do it, I think it's okay to have these really important discussions and then follow up by email and say, you know, I'm back in my office considering some of the things that you um, are interested in, and they're all different levels. And so I'm, I'm wondering what level, when we talk today, what level were you thinking about? I mean, even that's like an easy way out, but just to ease your, your way into being really direct about that, you can do that over email. Um, and then over time, you'll get really used to just saying, it's funny over like now, I mean, 16 years in, I have no problem asking anybody for anything and sitting quietly till they have an answer. But that's just reps. I mean, that just takes rep after rep. Um, let me see, I have notes I wanna make sure. Um, I think that's it on that one. All right, um, building relationships. So I talked a little bit about this, but we talk a lot about at conferences and stuff about what what's the best kind of fundraiser. And I think you have to be passionate about your mission, mainly for your own joy. Um, Cause it's, it's really hard to go out and sell something you don't believe in to the core of you. Um, I think you have to be a little bit curious about other people and you have to be really driven. I mean, it's one of those things where you have to make yourself go get out of the office and meet with people. And I think sometimes people who aren't driven and motivated try to get into this and they're like, I, who just don't plan well, maybe it's a harder, it's a harder road. I think you have to be appropriately persistent. So uh, there's this fine line, right? Where you don't wanna be aggressive because you don't wanna turn people off, but you have to be persistent. And a lot of times what I try to tell our team they'll say, I know that person was ready to make this gift, but I can't get them to respond to me now. And so what I try to think about is a lot of times we're talking about people who are running companies and they have families and they have all these responsibilities. And so while closing that gift is maybe our top priority at work right now, we're their last priority. And so they'll get to us eventually. So there's some happy medium between poking every now and then. Um, I, I stick with people longer than most people do. So I just get this like gut feeling about somebody where I'm like, they're gonna make a gift, I just feel it. And then they put me off for, and I'm talking like put me off for two years. Like they may meet with me and then they delay it and then they delay the gift or even three years. And I'll just have this like feeling like I think they're gonna make a gift. And people, so sometimes people will say, how long do you keep people in your pipeline? Like in your, I'm like, oh, way longer than you should, but I just get a gut feeling. And then eventually they're like, I'm so, and I've had people say, I'm so glad you stuck with me. So stick with your gut about the, I feel like they're gonna make a gift. It's worth waiting it out because, and there's plenty of people that you know really are putting you off or people you know who really just aren't gonna make a gift, that's fine. But if you have that gut, it, it doesn't, I feel like it doesn't hurt anybody to stay connected every six months or so with that person that you're like, I think they're gonna come around. And I think, I think being result oriented is really lovely in this job because we're super goal driven and, and when you close a gift, the high high is really lovely. And um, I think being a relationship builder is a good piece of it. So. Is, is a huge piece of it. And that means keeping notes on somebody. So we have a system where we put contact reports in, but if you don't have a system, I think you should make one up. Like even if it's a Word document or it's an Excel spreadsheet, because it matters. I do it all the time for our Dean too. He'll get on a Zoom call, what we're doing right now um, during the pandemic. And I'll say, remember his name, his wife's name is Anna. He's got three kids, one just, you know, one just missed her senior year because of whatever. So then our Dean's on the call and he's like, 
oh yeah, don't you have a senior? What was her senior year like? And he looks like he remembered and he's really sympathetic and awesome. He is sympathetic and awesome, but he can't remember everything about everybody. And so having those kind of notes where you, I mean, write down the name of their pet if their pet is really important to them. I feel like all the time it's not fair because I'll remember, th- I, I feel like people sometimes are like, you remember so much. And I'm like, no, oh, I take notes. I mean, I feel like it's a little dishonest, but it's, it's like a piece of what we do. And it matters to people that you remember things. I try to write down anniversaries and birthdays and just send a note. I send a quick text um, with our bigger donors. We do more than that. But anybody who I'm working with, I try to have it on my calendar when their birthday is. And I just send a, send a text. Um, knowing their anniversary, ask about their kids and know their names and be their friend. I mean, I have actually gotten to the point in my life where I think I'm not a good friend of my real friends, like my friends outside of work, because I do, I feel like we spend so much of our time doing thoughtful things in birthday cards and emails and stuff that I'm more intentional at work now with our donors than I am with anyone else. But um, we talk a lot about in our office. So, and the folks who work at Auburn know this too. So, we have all sorts of fundraisers, like just in engineering, there are seven of us who travel. And some of us are really good listeners. Some of us are really warm and fuzzy people. Some of us are really good at numbers and statistics and are, you know, are more engineer-like. Um, some do really well with just one-on-one visits. Some of us know how to work the room really well. So my answer in that is, I say that because I think anyone can do major gift fundraising. Like sometimes people think it has to be that really outgoing person and it's not, it doesn't always have to be that. Um, If you can sit down and build relationships with people and everybody knows how to build relationships with people, I think being trustworthy is probably the most important thing of all. So if you have integrity and you're trustworthy, you can be, you can be a major gift fundraiser because those are the two most important things. So no matter because we have introverts in our office who do a phenomenal job. We have extroverts who do a phenomenal job. It's just different. Um, so I guess my thing about, I guess I, I think it's the most, the most important thing you can do is to be trustworthy and honest so that, because people are really, I always say we're selling a warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, we're not selling a product. And so people have to really trust you. Um, and then the only other thing I was going to say is with contact reports, a lot of times having that history, I try to be really thorough because I just always think if I fall off the face of the earth tomorrow, I want someone to take that relationship over because I care about that donor enough that they don't have that much of a dip if I were to leave this position. And so um, that's a really important thing about contact reports too, is that you're helping that donor to always stay connected to that organization if you're really thorough so that someone else can take over someday if you're not in that role any longer. Okay, I've been talking a lot. Any questions? No? Okay. Um, interrupt me if there are. Okay, so make direct asks. Get out of the office and get, and get in front of people um, and ask for money. And I am really, um, so I ask almost on every initial visit and that's not the way everybody does it at all. But I work with engineers and they are really, um, I feel like I'm, I'm like saying this, but they, they are like, if I've gotten, if they are gonna take 30 minutes of their time during their work day to meet with me in their office, and I don't get around to what I really meant to ask for, and then I try to see them again, they are point blank going to say, well, what did we not cover last time? (laughs) And so it's more to me, more about a good use of somebody's time. I'm really clear on the front end. I'm clear over the phone. I'm clear over email that I'm, I am a frontline fundraiser. I'm unapologetic. And so people will say, oh, are you going to come to ask me for money? And I'm like, I am. And you want me to be doing that because you care about your institution and you want me to be asking everybody for money. And I'll say, but we do want to get to, I mean, there's, we want to get to know them. We want to know their story. We want to plug them in. We have advisory boards and we have, they can come speak to students and they can attend events. So there's plenty that they can do that isn't philanthropic, but I am really clear that we're asking for money. Um, And I ask for a major gift almost on every, this is not how everybody does it at all. There, there are plenty of people in um, my team who will really, really get to know somebody for maybe six months to a year, two years, and then make a really strong, intentional, large ask. And that makes perfect sense. I almost get with everybody and ask for, because you can make a major gift for 25000 which is $5,000 a year over five years. And our scholarship program is awesome where it's, it's stewarded really well. They get a printout of the student and then they're invited to an event where they get to meet the student. So because I'm so comfortable with that stewardship process, I ask almost everybody, because who doesn't want to have a student who looks like them when they were in college that they get to meet every year? It's magic. And so I almost ask every engineer, particularly a lot of them work for matching gift companies so they can sometimes support us at half the cost of that because their company will match. 
So I almost do that like an annual annual giving ask or like a trust gift because I know that they're going to fall in love with the program and our students at that point. And then later I ask them maybe to name a room or to start to start a professorship. There's no right or wrong in my mind. I feel like when I uh, my my last senior director really got on me about how much money that I, he kept saying you're not asking for enough money but I knew I was staying in Auburn so I would say I'm in this for the long con like I'm going to be here forever so at some point I'm going to ask these people for all the money but I just like I have time to to build that um the other thing I sometimes give our donors a um a giving plan so I'll sit down with them and say you know, once I've gotten to know them well enough and I'm comfortable enough, especially our young alumni, or even I say young people who are even like my age, young, uh, I'll say, we'd love for you to do a major gift and start a scholarship. And then someday, and then you can, after you complete that major gift, you can continue to give to that scholarship every year. So it continues to grow. And then I'll say, and then we'd love for you someday to um, give to some, like your program in a really big way or name a space or to make a really big stretch gift. And then we also would want you someday to add Auburn in your estate plans. And I don't know if it's because I work with engineers, but they're like, oh, I love a plan. You know, I gave them and I gave them goals. Everybody loves goals, right? And we'll say your estate plan can support those, the scholarship or the, you know, whatever, but that's kind of what it looks like to be involved. And then along the way, there are advisory boards they can join, they can come to events and be thanked and they can um, speak to students and things like that. But in general, I almost give everybody, I try to say this is what the trajectory of giving looks like at Auburn. Um, let's see. And to me too, you're planting seeds, you're educating people about this. So I, um, I'm really direct and unapologetic about it. And I do say all the time, you want me to be doing this. If you love this organization, you want me to be asking everybody for a major gift. You want all of us to be doing that. Um, and I think sometimes uh, we have so many alumni who will say to us why, when we write articles about them, our communications office, and they'll say why, like when, about their time frame, why they gave then, and they will say things like, no one at, had asked me prior to this. No one had been to see me. And we're like, oh, it's such a good assurance to us that we're doing the right things by going to see people. Because when people say that, I hadn't been asked. I hadn't made a gift because I hadn't been asked. It just motivates us more to go, go make more asks. Um, and rejection does happen. And that I've gotten, you get numb to that too over time. I think it's really hard at first, but I would always say to myself, okay, it qualifies for them, them for the future, then no one else is going to go see them and try to, you know, we're not going to keep taking them to dinner if they're not going to give us a major gift. So it's like, it saves our time, right? Finite amount of time. So it helps you with your time in the future. And maybe it's not the right project or the right time. Maybe you got it wrong. And sometimes that happens. Like sometimes you get it wrong where you're like, this wasn't, I was off on this. This wasn't, they're not as interested in this as I thought they were. And so maybe there's another time when a different project makes sense or sometimes they don't tell you everything about their finances and there might be some reason that a major gift doesn't make sense right now. Um, but the thing behind that is if you have enough people that you've made an ask of, you're still gonna make your goals. So that's why I say build a large pipeline because then they're all falling at different times. So if you see enough people and make enough asks, your money will continue to come in if you keep doing that because even if people say no, you have enough people who will say yes as well. Um, I have on here, uh, fundraisers should use pride, not apology when asking for a gift for a ch charity that's doing good work. I feel, I, I know you all feel this way, but I feel proud to do the work we do. I feel like we've gotten into this wonderful career that some people, there's people in this world that don't even understand or know what we do, but it's it's magical when you're really, when you really believe in your in your organization and you're creating legacy for families, but you're also creating, I mean, all of you have, I look through the list of people, you're doing really wonderful things in this community. And so it's important that you're doing the work you do um, and you're changing people's lives and you get to be the vehicle that allows that to happen. I think it's a pretty cool, I think it's a pretty cool thing. Um, I have one slide on corporate giving. This is probably not my best, uh, I'm a really good person to person fundraiser. And I know corporate fundraising is much of the same. Uh, a lot of the things are the same as personal gifts that you have to build rapport and build a relationship and have a case statement and make asks and thank them. You do all the same things you do with corporations. But um, I think that on all individual visits, so when you're meeting with people, I always try to ask about their corporate connections. So can their company make a, you know, could their, would it be beneficial for their company to make a major gift? Are they affiliated with some other company we don't know about? Could they introduce us to people at a company that we didn't know about? 
um, I think that company gifts have to be unique and it has to appeal to their specific company. A lot of times with engineering, ours is because they want to hire our students. Um, so for company benefits, it has to either enhance their reputation or improve employee respect. Sometimes our engineering companies give because our engineers like for them to. And so, and that's where that matching gift, gifts come in often. Um, it creates employee pride for a company. And then it also sets them apart from their competitors. So sometimes we have companies who give because it makes them look really good. And maybe they're among the other, like say you take the oil companies and one of them maybe gives us more than others. We've, I've had it happen, I'm, like I said, I raise money for civil engineering and we have one company who will come to campus and they're like, why is Browsfield and Gory's name all over everything? And I'm like, well, yours can be too. Um, and so sometimes it's that healthy competition that allows us to get some gifts because they want to have their name on things the same way that other companies do. Um, and I wrote many companies use their products as their currency and donations. So sometimes companies are gonna give you gifts in kind and that's okay too because sometimes it saves us a ton of money to have them give us things uh instead of instead of actually cash donations so the only thing i have to say about this is this is why corporate fundraising is hard for me because you get the you think you have the decision maker in the room and then you figure out you're like wait this person really isn't going to be the final yes or no but you need to still get through them to get to the next person and then by the time you finally get to the decision maker then they have some organizational change and that person's not the decision maker but I think on a local level, probably in Auburn, that's less likely to happen. I think you probably can get to the decision maker much easier. So I may be talking about big engineering companies, um, but that's why I think corporate fundraising is really hard. But um, I think locally, it's probably, you can find the decision maker, but with it's the same thing that you do with individuals that you, you have to build rapport with them, you have to get them engaged in your program, and then you have to steward them just the same way you do, would with an individual. Um, so stewardship. Um, it results in repeat gifts. You have to tell donors impact. I feel like um, before you make a new ask, I don't think you can say thank you enough. We Sometimes people will go, oh, well, they got a thank you note from this person, this person, this. I don't think that ever matters. I don't think you can send too many emails, too many texts, too many letters, too many handwritten notes uh, to thank somebody. I think sometimes a thank you contact is a pleasant surprise. So if you're not just going to somebody and always asking and you just go to see them just to say thank you. Like just, this is how we use your gift and I needed you to know about this. So sometimes I'll be walking past a building, like a room that somebody named and I see a student in there and I'm like, hold on. And I stop and take a picture because they're studying in their student room. And I'm like, look at us using your room. I love this. You know, I try to do things like that that are just, you know, thoughtful throughout the day. Or um, if there's money, I'm trying to think like people who have supported our tutoring program, when we've seen students being tutored, I'll shoot them a text and go, look, there's tutoring happening because of you. Um, so just little thoughtful things like that. Um, don't ask again until the impact of the last gift was shared. They're gonna tell other people if they have a great experience, but they're also gonna compare you to other charities because most people who are philanthropic are philanthropic with all sorts of places. And so when you don't thank them enough, they notice. And uh, when you thank them really well or you do something really special and extra, they notice. And so um, we have it happen in Auburn internally. I can say this because I know I have COSAM colleagues on here, but they do a phenomenal job with their scholarship reception. And we have some married couples who are an engineer and a COSAM grad. And, and we hear the feedback all the time, like, well, why didn't you guys do this? And why didn't you do this? I'm like, I don't know. Let me go see what they're doing because ours isn't, ours isn't as good as theirs. So we have it. Ha so we have to be really cognizant of that, that they're giving our and our alumni are giving to all sorts of places on campus and so if somebody does a much better job than us of stewarding them they notice and um and they're giving to other universities too we have people who maybe have a couple who the other one they'll tell us they're like this group but sometimes they give us great advice too right they'll say this company did this do this you know this this charity did this so um just be aware of the um and the stewardship thing, by the way, I, I looked at my notes. I have, um, sometimes it's not about the size of the gift. So we have um, John and Rosemary Brown who named two, um, created the theater in Auburn and also created a student achievement center in engineering. And they gave, you know, they gave the university a $52 million gift. And that was wonderful. And we have thanked them and thanked them and, and they are amazing people, I love them. But I think about, when I think about the gifts that have been really impactful in my career, 
I think about, um, there's an engineer named Pam Boyd who her and her husband are both first generation college students and they have one daughter and they both work for the power company. And they did their endowed scholarship. And I sat down at their dinner table. They had invited me to their house for dinner to do it. And when they signed the paperwork and figured out the gift agreement, like how their criteria for their student, they looked at each other and started to cry. And they said, this is such a big deal to us because we paid for school ourselves. Auburn changed our lives. We have a whole different trajectory. And we, and they picked a, they were both transfer students. They picked a transfer student from a rural area. Like they did a criteria that would be just like them. And those are one of those days where I went home and I'm like, That's, I can't thank them enough for that. And I felt like they made a decision out of their, out of their, checkbook you know when someone's making a gift that you know they feel in their checkbook they took it out of their monthly money I, and those big donors are wonderful and lovely too and i'm very glad we have them and, I, and i'm glad they do it but i don't know that that is out of their bank account and so out of their checkbook you know and so when somebody makes the gift that's out of their checkbook sometimes i'm more thankful like i'm like what can we do to be thankful enough for these the where i know it was a stretch gift for this person so all that to say i feel like it doesn't matter the size of the gift sometimes it's the smaller ones that you know are more painful is not right, the right word, but are more of a stretch for a person that you just need to make sure you're thankful for all levels of gifts. Okay, I added this slide about COVID-19 fundraising because I'm sure you're all going, this is great, but I can't go visit anybody right now. <laughs> so um, we can't either. So stewardship, stewardship, all we're doing is stewardship and cultivation. And so we are doing well checks. We have called, I'm just telling you what we're doing. I don't know if it's useful to you, but we've called everybody and just to check on them. And some people are home a lot more right now. So they, and especially some of our older retired folks, they're loving the phone calls. We're talking to them more than we've ever talked to them because we have time to do that. And so they have time to talk to us. And I feel like we're going to come out ahead with that because our relationships are even stronger with them. Um, we've had Zoom calls with key leaders. So we've done some with our dean. We just added some with our department chairs and our um, just some faculty, you know, groups of faculty that we've invited alumni to. And they've actually been really fun. Um, we've done social Zoom calls with peer groups. So I've got some Nashville engineers who I know know each other well. And so I did a like a happy hour with them with our Dean and his wife. And it was really, I mean, as fun as Zoom can be, it was fun. And, um, and so we have done, we have carried, I said carry on gently and carefully with current asks. So we have people who have not been affected financially right now at all. And so if we were in the middle of an ask with them, we have made sure that it's a phone call not over email but we've kind of gently said i know you're thinking about this things are totally different now are you good so we've closed some gifts because people were already on track and they're okay with it but we've been very 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 careful but those were relationships that had already been built it was we were they're strong enough relationships for us to have real conversations right now with them so we have been able to close some gifts um it's given us some time to cultivate new relationships so like I said, some people have less free time right now, but some people have more. So some people are willing to take visits with us that weren't before. And so um, we've been doing cultivation only. We're not soliciting anybody new, but we're cultivating some new folks. We're getting some new people on. We have someone who's doing parent fundraising in our office and she's gotten groups of parents together who she's never met. And that's a sticky thing too, because uh, parents have all sorts of questions right now, which they should, right? But it's worth it to have that because now when she goes out on the road later when we can really travel, those people are going to take a visit with her because they had a Zoom call with her and she introduced them to some, you know, a department chair or other parents in their area. So it can really be a time to just build relationships. Um, and some programs have a stronger need now due to the pandemic. So it might, I, I say not to ask for money right now, but your appeal might actually be timely if it have if you know that there's a need caused by the pandemic and that might actually make a stronger ask. So we had, for instance, um, some of our Keystone folks, which are people who give annual $10,000 a year annually to the Dean for him to be able to pivot and be nimble. We didn't exactly ask them, but we wrote them a message saying, hey, because of you, we were able to put all of our, we ordered all this software, $100,000 worth of software so that every student could have the software they needed at home. We ordered um, MiFi's, we ordered laptops for computer for students who didn't have it and engineering paid for that because we had these donors who give this money every year so that we can be nimble in, in an emergency. And we had a ton of people who gave more money because of that, just by explaining that there was a need that we had to fill. So things can be timely in that way. Um, my last slide is, 
that one of our big donors uses this, but the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. And then fundraising is a gentle art of teaching, of teaching the joy of giving. So um, our work changes people's lives, sometimes more for the donors than the recipients. And so I feel lucky that we get to do this career. So I hope you all, um, I feel like major gifts is, is, a, is important work. I think it's really meaningful and the high highs are outweigh the lows by far. So that's the end of my, that's my spiel. Thank you so much, Margaret. I, I learned so much. Um, does anyone have any questions? You can unmute yourself and speak now, or you can, if you'd prefer to put it in the chat, I am, I can ask it for you. Kim says, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad that you covered that last slide on COVID because I know <clears throat> when we spoke a few weeks ago, you were telling me a little bit about um, the social hour. And I know if anyone is a member of WPB or, or follows what they do, Kim has been doing a great job with that as well with stewardship. That is so important. Um, you can see people who are not getting the socialization that they're getting near during normal times, getting it, and they're, they will remember that. Um, so I'm so glad that you covered that. And also that now may be a good time for you to ask, depending on what you have going on. So that was great. Well, if anyone doesn't have any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and um, in, in our presentation. Thanks again for joining us today to learn more about securing major gifts. Please join me in thanking Margaret for an excellent program. If you have any additional questions or comments, feel free to email me at b-r-a-n-y-b-a at auburn.edu. And that's all for today. Thank you again for taking the time to invest in your organization. And don't forget that next week at 10 a.m. on June 24th, we will hear from Greg Detke. Um, the Cary Center Philanthropist in Residence as he hosts a conversation on four steps of donor fundraising cultivation. And you can register by sending me an email. So again, Margaret, thank you so much. Everyone is saying how much they loved your presentation and we truly enjoyed it. Everyone have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.